Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to come before you again in your house of prayer. We thank you for revelation. We thank you for knowledge. We thank you for understanding. But we ask that you just continue to lead and guide us unto all truth, oh God. We thank you, Lord, as you are light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. We thank you for what you're doing in the very midst right now. But we thank you for all things, and we just give you praise, we give you glory. Lord, we adore you, we love you, because there is none like thee, O oh God. We thank you for making habitation within us, as well as being a comforter amongst us. Lord, we give you all the glory and the honor as we dive into these various subjects and these matters. Lord, continue to unfold and unveil, giving us spiritual truth that we may be able to apply to our everyday life, that we may grow thereby. We give you the glory and the honor in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, the branch, the nail. Father, we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Have your way, Holy Ghost. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, have your way right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you right now as you have your way, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. We pray, amen. When I think about Sunday and the way the Lord was using me on Sunday, it was more or less a preface for what we're going to cover tonight. For those who were here on Sunday, we dealt with Jesus there in Caesarea Philippi. And we made mention of Bashan and talked about the gate of hell. We're going to dive into that on this evening in the context of where it fits with our studies. So we turn here today, and we were looking at a couple of things. And I want to go through these sheets briefly. We talked about the divine counsel. If you look on the back of that sheet, the reason these lines are here is because you were supposed to have gotten these prior to the class so that you could have written your notes there. But this is still a good place of studying with your notes so that when you do take your quiz, you can able to go back and follow the spirit world. Okay, when we talked about the spirit world, we said it was in reference to the heavenlies and the earthly. Spiritual and divine be be beings, the Elohim, and kingdoms, all right? All of these things, when you think about the spirit world, just don't think about just heaven alone. Don't think about just demons, or don't think only about the Holy Spirit, but think about the entire spirit realm. When you think about the entire spirit realm, those spirits that are in the heavenlies, another word for heavenlies is what? Starts with a C. Celestial. All right. Or there are also those spirits that roam through the earth. Many times those spirits that are roaming through the earth or working through individuals are those that we refer to as demons. All right. But the Bible also said that we entertain angels unaware. We understand that according to the book of Hebrews. So when you think about the spirit world, Begin to allow your mind to go way beyond just angels, demons, but think even on principalities and powers, the rules of darkness, all of these various entities, God, Christ, and who knows what other entities are there. As we go into angelology, we'll talk more about the cherubim and the seraphim, and like I say, and those different levels of angelic beings. The key terms you want to recognize... Remember, when you see key terms, these are words that you may potentially see on an exam or test. Remember what the word divine mean. When we talk about divine, we said divine is like what? It's to be what? God-like. Talking about divine of or from or like God when we're talking about divine. Holy. Not necessarily, because 
Holy is more so to be set apart. Something that's consecrated or sanctified. Um, you have beings, you know, that may have similarities to God, but may not be holy. Similarity as far as being spiritual beings, all right? Maybe there's certain attributes where they don't have to walk on feet, but maybe because of their spiritual nature, they can roam from one place unto another. So they could have attributes, but they may not necessarily be holy. Okay, so just kind of not when you think about God or the word God in general. Remember, God is more or less an attribute. It's not who he is. He is Yahweh. You know, he is a type of Elohim. But it's going way beyond of just what we have considered holy. For example, if I ask the class, I see you. If I ask the class, you know, how would you describe something holy? Without using the words sanctified, set apart, how would you, in your mind, what do you interpret holy to be? Nothing missing, nothing broken. Pure? All right. Consecrated, yes, but why, why do we think pure when we think holy? Because it's, it, it, the way I see it is that it's, it's basically uh, the, attribute, the attribute of God who is pure in his form and his nature and his character. Right. God himself is pure, but to be holy, the word holy, does the word holy mean something that is pure? Or does the word holy just simply mean something that I have set aside for a specific use? Something I have set apart or I have consecrated for a particular purpose? Something that has been anointed for a particular task doesn't necessarily have to be holy. Not holy, pure. All right? Everybody understand? So what happened if I'm an athlete? If I'm a ball player, now I'm stretching this, you know, as an example, because I'm not a ball player, all right? <laughs> By no means. Have no handle, all right? But if I was a ball player, a professional ball player, I might have a certain pair of kicks that I use when I'm playing ball, and I don't use those kicks for nothing else. Those are set aside only for when I play ball. So... If I'm that professional ball player, to me, in my mindset, because these are set aside for a specific reason, a specific task, those are holy to me. Don't mean they're pure, because they may smell funky. Right. So what happened, when you think about the temple and the things that God gave Israel and said, this is holy. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Set apart for me and me only. That's what that day is for. It's a day set aside for reverence unto God. You can't even work. And I was speaking with some Jews not long ago, and I didn't realize this, that many times that when they would have their jobs, their jobs had to be within such a proximity from where they live, especially if they got off work on Friday because they knew that at a certain time, they have to recognize their Sabbath. They're not even permitted to drive their vehicles. On. They have to walk to the synagogue from wherever they stay. I was like, because to get in a vehicle to drive would be work. They couldn't even tie aprons a certain way. No, you couldn't do anything in that day. So a lot of times in our understanding, when we think holy, we think, you know, uh, we think about tradition. We think about our religious tradition. We don't really conceive or, or perceive the idea of that something is just holy when it's set apart. So what happened, we'll say, oh, well, if the person has on lipstick, then they don't look holy. Well, maybe that's the lipstick that they set aside for Sunday. <laughs> I'm being a little facetious here, but I want you to understand where I'm going with this, all right? For example, there are robes that I have set aside for a specific use that when I come into the service. So when I have that robe on, I may not walk into the restroom with that robe on. 
I may not walk downtown with that robe on. If the children were doing a play, I may not let them wear that robe because that robe is set aside. It doesn't mean there's something special to that robe that that robe went on somebody else that all of a sudden they get all of these chills or their hair on their arms stand up because there is some special anointing in there. No, but to me, I've set that apart so that I can use that, that it's not contaminated with nothing else. Anybody understand? Was there a question about that? All right? So... It's, it's a, a, a level of understanding based on what the word itself means. So if we look up the word holy, let's use the Vines Expository Dictionary. And let's see how it describes it. Gazo. To set a part to God. All right. Um, also, a word they have here sanctification. Which is basically a synonym for the word holy or holiness. It also signifies a separation to God. Um, another word that they use here is to sanctify. It's also used in reference to a sacred character. First time I've seen that. Typically, when you're talking about those things that are set apart or set aside as something tangible. So, but what you see here, to be holy or to be set apart or to be sanctified, to be consecrated, or to be anointed. It's not often equated with a supernatural power, even though that's the way we have always interpreted. We say if somebody's anointed, oh, then that means they got a power, or they're releasing an anointing. The word anointing is not typically used like that in Scripture. Anointed persons or individual is one who have been inaugurated for an office to do a task. God has anointed you for a specific purpose. The energy or power you possess when you are anointed is the result of the Holy Spirit that's in you. That's why Jesus says when you receive the Holy Ghost, then shall you receive power. They were already appointed or anointed as apostles, but he said it's expedient for you to go away or the Holy Ghost will not come. But when the Holy Ghost come, you will have power. Not only have power, you have understanding because he leads and guides you to all truth and he teaches you all things. So the power of God is not the anointing but the power of God is the Holy Spirit that you possess. Yes, sir. Dedication and devoted. Yeah. You could use that as well. Dedicated. And what was the other one you said? Devoted, right. Like a devotion. So, back to the analogy of the sneakers. If those particular sneakers were Jordans, do you think I'm going to run any faster? I'm going to jump any higher? I'm going to have hang time like Michael? No. If I had that ability, it wasn't because I put on a special pair of shoes. 
It's because of the training, the discipline, and working in that particular field. The more often you work in something, the better you become at it. But when you're talking about ministry or ministry gifts, because it's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work through us, what happened, we're not relying on our own strength or our flesh. Our confidence is not in us. But because of God's spirit, he makes us equal for the task. The more fluent you are in working in the spirit, the more confidence you have in the spirit to where a person says, wow, you really excel. It's not me, but the more I trust God, the more God entrusts me with. The more confidence and the more trust you put in God, the more he can entrust you with. Goes back to the scripture. If you're faithful in what? A few things, he'll make you what? Over much. We know they're gifts of the Spirit, but once again, it's not gifts because you were simply anointed. The gifts come from who? The Spirit. So we're talking about the Spirit world, and there are certain attributes that we find that are similar in the Spirit world. Okay? That was our commercial for the night. <laughs> okay. So, but it's necessary to understand that when we go into some other things. So when we talk about the spirit world, divine beings, we know we're terrestrial, celestial. We've been tested on those areas. When we go down to the next part where it says God's kingdom, we know who Yahweh is. Now, there are times where when you see Yahweh, it may not be spelled out completely. And part of that is due to the reverence for his name because they were not supposed to use God's name in vain. So what happens sometimes when you see Yahweh, instead of being spelled out completely as that, sometimes it will just be capital Y, capital H, capital W capital H. That's the abbreviated way. Abbreviated way. All right? Yahweh. That's who he is. Okay? Uh, the Trinity, we're all familiar with who the Trinity is. Who's the Trinity? Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Is that word in your Bibles? It's not in our Bibles. The word Trinity is not in our Bible, but we see the Trinity at work in the Bible, okay? Not only did we say we see him in the book of 1 John when he said there are three that bear record in heaven, but we also know he was there in the very beginning. He said, let us. We also know that he was there when he talked about the allocation of spiritual gifts because one was a minister of the gifts, the other brought about diversity of gifts, and one was the operating of the gifts. Is still the Trinity at work. So as you go from the various dispensations, from innocence all the way unto grace, you'll see the Trinity at work. All right? There are certain scripture reference you also notice that I have here, and these would be those that you want to pay attention. So when you do have an exam, sometimes those scripture references will be right here on the page. Uh, when we talk about the divine three, that's another way of describing who? The Trinity, the divine three is another way of describing the Trinity, okay? Sons of God, what is important to remember about the sons of God? Who are they? Who are the sons of God? Don't overthink it. Sons of God, what does the Bible tell us about the sons of God in the Old Testament? Who are they? They were angels, angelic beings, the watchers. That's also accepted because of Genesis 6. But we also see there in the book of what in the Old Testament? When God had this meeting with the sons of God, the book of Job, all right? They were there. When we get to the New Testament, and when you start talking about the sons of God, who is he speaking about? Who? Saints. The saints. Holy men. Set apart men, those filled with the Holy Ghost. We know that because of Romans 8, the sons of God, 
All right? Then are they the offspring of God? Well, what about the women? Where does that leave them? <laughs> They're still the daughters of God, right? Okay? All right. So, as we go on a little further here, we also talked about judgments. When you're talking about making a judgment, or in God's case, a divine judgment, what are we talking about? What is God doing there? When do we see God making a judgment? Typically, it's after there's a rebellion. Not necessarily talking about the Day of Atonement, but when God's making a judgment, he's making a determination. When he's making a decision. When he's bringing about judgment. Typically, when you think about the prophets of the Old Testament, the prophets of the Old Testament, they first come with a word of warning. Typically, not always, but the majority of the time, they come with the word of warning. If you do this, then God will do this. If you don't do this, then God's going to do that. And then what happens? If they don't take heed to the warning, then God sends the prophet back again. And this is when they holler, and cometh thou peaceably? Are you the one that troubleth Israel? When God sent the prophet back this time, as he did in the case of Nahum, he didn't come sending a word of warning, but he came with the word of judgment. It always pays to take heed to the word of warning so we don't have to experience the judgment. The judgment of God typically is the wrath of God. So therefore, when you're talking about judgment, the judgment of God, does it only fall on men? No, but on the entire creation, whether natural beings or spiritual beings. When those sons of God in Genesis 6, when they begin to make unto themselves wives by the daughters of men, there was a judgment made. The judgment that came about caused those watchers to be in chains of darkness. When the men of Noah's day rebelled, what happened? There was a judgment that came about upon the earth. God's judgment was the flood. When they were erecting the Tower of Babel, trying to make a name for themselves, when God came down and saw what the men were doing in the city, the Bible lets us know that God made a judgment. What did he do? Changed the language, confounded their language. He called the place Babel, and he separated them. They could not finish what they started out to do. So the judgment of God are the actions of God when we rebel against his commandment. Yes, sir. Well, then, um, in Genesis 3, Mm -hmm. Judgment is against the serpent and the woman, the man. And the man, all three. All three components. The man, the woman, the serpent. But he approached the man first. Because the man was given the commandment. Even though the man threw the woman up under the bus. I pray that men don't do that now. <laughs> Boy, look at the faces on these women here. <laughs> I don't know what kind of men y'all got. Them pie crust men, they flaky. <laughs> All right. But then what happened? The woman threw the serpent under the bus. <laughs> All right, everybody want to play the blame game. But we're talking about judgment. Okay. So we go on even further. Now we're dealing with the response to rebellion. And therefore we see the judgment of the divine beings. Then there is something called excommunication. I know we haven't really dealt much with that word. What does it mean when we're talking about excommunication? Anybody got any idea? You want to read it? That's the scripture where 
the man had his father's wife. And it should not be said amongst you. It's not even said amongst the Gentiles. So they were told or commanded to put such a one, what? Out. It's a dismissal. Yes. Right. They were expelled or expelled from the garden. They were put out. So excommunication, once again, falls in line with a judgment when there is a violation of God's word. So when you think excommunication, you want to think of a putting out or a putting away? A dismissal? A suspension? Right, all of those nice words, ostracized, and exclusion, and an excommunication doesn't have to be permanent, all right? An excommunication could be indefinite. The time of reconciliation or restoration may be uncertain, but it can be. There was one scripture where it talked about, you know, I think it was the same scripture where it talked about, you know, basically like giving them over unto the adversary for a season. So in, in 1 Timothy, it's very similar to what he was talking about there in Corinthians. In the first chapter, uh, he was talking about Hymenaeus and Alexander. And he said in chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith and have made shipwreck of whom is Hymenaeus, and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. That's, that's a hard saying, you know, almost like, just like, basically like, leave them out there. <laughs> Let Satan have a field day with them. But the only thing about that is, once again, it's indefinite. Because there's that possibility of them coming back and being restored. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I want to go to that into the Amplified. So it says in the Amplified, I think you can read it here. You are to deliver this man over to Satan for physical discipline to destroy the carnal lust which prompted him to incest that his spirit may yet be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So without going into too much with this, when you're talking about the destruction of the flesh, Dake says it like this. He says, the purpose of delivering him to Satan was to destroy the flesh. This required members to withdraw all fellowship and spiritual influence from the man and to quit praying for him so as to permit Satan to afflict his body. Thus, perhaps bringing him to a point of repentance. That his spirit might be saved in the end. This was effective for in the second letter, Paul wrote the church to forgive him lest he should be swallowed up by excessive sorrow. So what he's saying is that the idea or the thought is that if you render such a one or surrender such a one over to the adversary, once Satan finished having a field day with them, that maybe they'll come to their senses and say, Lord, Help me. I'm sorry. I repent. I want to be saved. Think about the prodigal son. Similar to that degree. He thought he was doing his thing. He leaves the father's house. He spends everything he has on riotous living, doing what he want to do. But then when it get hard and he realized how much better he had it at home. And what happens? He said, my father's servants are doing better than what I'm doing. 
I need to go back home. Maybe I'll be received as a servant or as a slave. To only find that when he come back home, guess who's all forgiven? The father. And his arms are wide open. The one who didn't forgive was the other brother. He became jealous. Why are you letting him back? He said, he was out there wasting your money on harlots. How did he know he was out there? He was out there with a cell phone. Now let me stop. <laughs> I can't wait to show Bishop this. <laughs> All right. The destruction of the flesh that hopefully the spirit would be saved one day. So excommunication. You may see that word again. That's why I'm, I'm elaborating on that. Okay. Um, as I go through this, this sheet here, and we talk about the fate of divine beings, we talked about that, the divine beings who have left their own habitation, we know what awaits them on the day of judgment. All right, spiritual geography, which is the section we've been dealing with for the past couple of weeks, which has been very interesting. Every time I go into one of these passages of scriptures, even though we went through them several times, but it's like I, I get something new out of it each time I go through it. All right. Once again, for those who can see, we talked about this kind of structure quite often. What did we say this structure was called? A ziggurat. All right. Ziggurat was a type of temple used to summon who or what? Gods. All right. To summon the gods. They believed that this would open a portal and give them access to the gods. That the gods would come to their requests. It was a way of them trying to domesticate the gods. This was the case that we see in the Tower of Babel. Although the scripture doesn't specifically say that it was a cigarette, but when you study ancient Mesopotamia and the Sumerians, you understood that these were the type of structures that they would build. It wasn't just specifically just to say, I want to just get all the way to heaven as if there was an elevator that would take them straight to God but it was to get into the heavenly sphere to get God's attention and say look what I've accomplished now you come to me alright the mindset of man want to dictate to his creator and say I want you to answer me you to respond to me you can't do that to God. That's not the way it works. But if you humble yourself before the hands of the almighty God, he will exalt you in due season or due time. But their whole motive and aim was to make a name for themselves. They weren't trying to spread the gospel. They wanted to be seen. They wanted to be recognized. We know Nimrod, one of Noah's descendants, we all got some of them like that in our family that we don't really claim. They show up at the cookout in the family reunion. All right. Used to say down south, oh, I love to see you come, but I love to see you go. <laughs> all right. So what we see here also in this, that Nimrod was basically one of the chief leaders. But because of their rebellion, God called it Babel. Interesting because we say that also came from an Akkadian word, Babylon or Babalu. And what do we say that that meant? Anybody remember? The Akkadian word that was used to describe Babel. That's right. The gates of the gods. Now, that's very interesting. The gate of the gods. Why is that so interesting? That kind of make you think about that, the gates of hell. Right. The region, the area. Okay, let me show you something. This place here. Anybody know where this is? That's right. Mount Hermon. To be more precise according to New Testament scripture, that's Caesarea Philippi. Now, when Jesus was there 
and made an announcement after Peter's great confession out to Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, upon this rock. What was he standing on when he said this? This rock. Upon this rock. It was also known as the grotto or pan. It was also called the gate of hell. This was called the gate of hell. It had a historical or tradition that it was from here as a type of portal of the one who possessed the authority of the underworld, Beelzebub. The Lord of the dead, the Lord of the flies. It's also synonymous with Satan himself. Right. So what happened when Jesus stood there, while theologians some 2,000 years later are trying to figure if he's talking about building the church upon Peter, or we try to read into it and make it more spiritual and say, well, maybe it was the confession of Peter that he meant when he said, I'm going to build my church upon this rock. Really what he was doing, he was saying that I'm come back to take my claim. I'm reclaiming power. I'm reclaiming dominion that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, interesting thing about this. Remember when we looked at these charts before when we talked about the interlinear Bible and we said that when they're translating, what they do, they find the words that are in that Greek or Aramaic language. In this case, because it was New Testament, it would have been in Greek. And they would find the English word for it. Now, when you see prevail, you see all of these Greek words. When you see not, you see the Greek word. When you see surface, you see the Greek word but when you come to the word against, there's no Greek word there. Meaning that that word was inserted because the one translating wants to make his complete thought. So the proper way to have interpreted that not that the gates of hell shall not prevail against, the gates of hell cannot withstand it. That changes the meaning of it. Because when you think about the gates of hell prevailing, it makes it appear like the church is on the defense. And the gates of hell are coming against the church. But when you look at it from the sense that it's the gates of hell can't withstand, that puts the church on the offensive, not on the defense. So therefore, we don't have to worry about the gates of hell having victory over us. The gates of hell are intimidated by the church. So when Jesus stood at Mount Hermon, he said, the gates of hell cannot withstand. The difference in having the understanding of what words mean. Sis. So that's when, when it says... Um Against, um, against this rock, I'll build my church. Let's go to the scripture, Mark 9. Well, Matthew. Let's go to Matthew. I like the way Matthew says it. Matthew is more ex expressive and more detailed oriented. Matthew, I think it's 17. 16? Yeah, 16, 16, 17. So I'm going to read the, uh, the verse. 16, 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, upon what rock? <laughs> let's go back there and look at that rock again this is a close up view upon 
this rock, I will build my ecclesia, my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. My, um, like rock, right? So when they say rock, they're actually talking about Mount, was it Mount? Mount Hermon. Hermon. But people think that since Peter, his name means rock, small stone, right. And then because the Roman Catholic Church is saying that they are the universal church. And they feel that their church has been erected on the bones of Peter. Although our scripture doesn't give us any clue that Peter ever went to Rome. It tells us about Paul going to Rome, but it never said Peter did. But the Roman Catholic Church said, no, our church is built on the bones of Peter, who is the rock. And we are, the word Catholic, in a sense, universal. We are the church. See? So, what we see here, once again, the church, we're not on the defense, but we stand strong offensively. Even if you think about it, the gates of hell, Normally a person put up gates and fences to protect themselves from something that's opposing them or something that may be a threat to them. Y'all know you live here in New York. I've never seen so many gates in my life. And I feel bad for some folk because when I drive by the house, it's like they're in a cage. Down south, we sleep with the doors open. Well, we used to, not no more. All right? <laughs> but we got ADT. <laughs> but that still ain't going to stop nobody from coming in. If a thief want to get in, he's going to get in. But normally when you feel threatened, you say, if I put up a gate, I got a sense of security. Hell has gates up. Because they see the church as a threat. You are a threat to the demonic spiritual kingdom. If we only understood that. But what happened, somehow or another, Satan convinced us otherwise. He convinced us that he has more power than he really has. I keep going back to the scripture, whether it be Isaiah or Ezekiel. And he began to say, is this the man that caused nations, this guy, he caused the nations to tremble? He said he would be narrowly looked at. He's talking about a charlatan. It doesn't say that he doesn't have power. But look at this scripture, as many times as we quote it. I went back and I saw this today again, and I'm like, wow, Lord, as many times as I quote that scripture, I think it's in 1 John. Let's go over to 1 John. And it's still dealing with the spiritual world. Chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4. And I love the way he starts in that first verse where he says, beloved, he's talking to us as children. I say us because he's writing unto the church to believers. He says, believe not every spirit. So John was very much aware that we are in the midst of spiritual warfare. He was very much aware that there is the existence of a spiritual world. But he says, believe not every spirit. But what? Try the spirits. Now, my Bible don't say try the spirit by the spirit. But how many times have you heard it quoted that way? Try the spirit by the spirit. And I asked the person one time, I said, well, how do you do that? Well, I feel a certain way. Wait a minute. What do you got to do with feeling? If you say you're trying the spirit by the spirit. But the Bible says, Try the spirit. In other words, test it. Prove it. 
to see whether it's of God or not. How do you test a spirit to see whether it's of God or not? You line it up with the sword of the spirit. That's it, the word of God. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, then let it be a lie. Let it be not true. Let it be of a contrary spirit if it doesn't line up with God's word. So what does John say here? Try the spirits, whether they are of God. Why? Because many false what? If you ever study your scriptures from the beginning all the way to the end, there's so much mention of false prophets. And God is either always having to warn Israel, who was Yahweh's portion. Remember that, Yahweh's portion, Yahweh's allotment. Even when we come to the age of grace, and we're talking about the church, he's still warning the church concerning false prophets. He said, because many false prophets are going out into the world. So that's why you have to try the spirit. Because he's saying these false prophets that are out there in the world, they are motivated by a spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. There is a spiritual force working behind them that's pushing them, that have anointed them for that work have set them apart for that word, have consecrated. There's nothing pure about it, but they've been consecrated. They have an assignment from hell to do their work. So even as God has those in his body that are being ordained to spiritual offices, Satan also has those that he has ordained amongst humanity to spiritual office to execute his will. And if you're not able to try the Spirit to determine whether they are of God or not, you won't be able to tell the difference. But they preach at that church across town. They got a lot of people that go there. And every time I go there, they, they're praising God, their hands in the air. Absolutely. It says, no marvel that Satan's angels be transformed. Was that in 2 Corinthians? That's it. Hold your place here in John. Let's go to 2 Corinthians real quick. Just so somebody had that reference. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers. What do they do? Transform us. <laughs> Decepticons. <laughs> All right? They transform themselves into the apostle. It's like a chameleon. You ever heard of the snake that they got? It's called a, not a snake, a lizard. He's a chameleon. He's able to camouflage himself and look like whatever he walks up against. That's how he ensnares his prey. So if he walks on a green leaf, he turns green. So you don't even see the threat. That's why if it were possible, the Bible said if it wasn't for the short of the days, even the very elect would be deceived. But then it goes further in verse 14, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into what? An angel of light. Look glorious. Has a glow. All so that he can hem you up. Therefore, it's no great thing if whose ministers? Who's his? Satan. Satan got ministers? I told you, he had an ordination service the other day also. Also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. It's a sad time. Just because a person got papers don't mean that God have anointed them. 
The scripture lets us know. Back in 1 John, the fourth chapter. 1 John, the fourth chapter, right where we were before. So now he's going to tell us how you're able to determine. It's not about feeling. Don't trust feelings. Some folk been in, got in some messed up relationships because of how they felt. Don't say it too loud. <laughs> it's not about feelings. Well, I feel no. <laughs> feelings come, they go. Right now, somebody says it's hot in here. As soon as I turn off, now I feel cold. All right? Feelings fluctuate. But look what he says in verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. He's telling us how we identify the Spirit of God. It's not about our feelings. One lady told me, no, but I feel it in my belly. Okay, so be it. If that's where your faith is in your belly, so be it. Somebody else said, well, no, I feel how because my arms and, and I get these like chill bumps. If that's what you feel, so be it. But don't you know, as keen, as subtle as Satan is, if he know that's all you're doing is going by what you feel, oh, well, I can manipulate this situation. I'm going to give him that feeling. Once again, that's how in our minds, because of tradition, how we come to understand what we thought was holy or anointed because of how we felt. Somebody sing a song in the sanctuary, we start crying, we're like, oh, that song was anointed. That person is anointed. Whitney Houston can sing a song and make you cry, but yet she was smoking crack. Living a promiscuous life. So was she anointed because you cried when she sung the song? Not necessarily. We got so accustomed to measuring how God operates and moves, how we feel. But then what happens when the day comes you don't feel nothing? Then you're going to say, God, you're not here? Something's wrong because I don't feel nothing. That's like as if when Elijah was in the cave. Oh, well, a small voice? That can't be God. That's not how God moves. So let me just look and see if God's coming somewhere else. We could disregard what God has done or is doing because we're trying to measure everything by our own litmus test. Instead of how the scripture says, hear how he said you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So if it speaks of Jesus coming in flesh, then he says, that's when you know it's of God. However, it says in every spirit that confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Now, Okay, this is kind of coming as I'm doing this, so bear with me. He says here, every spirit that confessed that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So if it's of the spirit, of, I'm going to say of the Holy Spirit. of the Holy Spirit, they're going to confess Jesus Christ has did what? Come in the flesh. This marker about seeing his last day. All right, let's see. And then of the 
flesh, and every spirit confess not, okay, if they confess not, confess not what? Jesus coming in the flesh, then what are they of? All right. Like I said, I'm just getting this, so just bear with me. I'm looking at words. If he's confessed Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, then it's of the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus, don't think of Christ as a last name. The Lord's anointed. The Lord's anointed, the Messiah, so therefore anyone who confessed that Jesus, who is the Lord's anointed, and is also called the Messiah, has come into this world wrapped in flesh, then he's of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a lot of religious groups that said that Jesus, who is the Lord's anointed, the Messiah, has not come. So if, they're not, if they say that, then they're not of the Holy Spirit, but they are of what? So where does that put the Jews? <laughs> Is it right now? <laughs> what does that say about the Muslims? Antichrist, don't just think revelation, but anti meaning to oppose or against. So therefore, if they are not speaking Jesus coming in the flesh, God coming in the flesh and dwelling amongst us, then they are preaching against the spirit of God, and therefore they are of another spirit if it's an anti Christ, if it's an anti-anointed, an anti-Lord's anointed, then it becomes a demonic. Anybody follow that? Maybe by next week when I had more time to kind of marinate on it, it'll, it'll, it'll sound different. All right? Because any spirit, because remember how he started off, try the spirits to see whether they have God. Because they're different kind of spirits. The Bible lets us know you're either hot or you're cold. There is no lukewarm. So either you are for God or you're against him. If you're either in God's kingdom or you are part of whose kingdom? Satan's kingdom. No man can serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other, cleave the one and despise the other. So therefore, when you are anti-Christ, you are pro-Satan. So when they deny that Jesus ever walked in flesh because we're still waiting on our Messiah, then you are the anti-Christ. That's a hard saying. I better not say it too loud. They might do me like they're doing Kanye West right now. <laughs> yes, go ahead. For those who are watching remotely, uh, I just read St. John chapter 16. Now we're going to 1 Corinthians 12. Holy Ghost. That's it. By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you the license to legally say that Jesus is Lord. All right? But back here to 1 John, this, this is, is going to get more interesting here. And this is something so familiar. You hear it all the time. I know I quote it all the time. And the scripture says, and every spirit that confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. Not just a man of sin, <laughs> but that spirit should come. 
So that implies that there are spirits that are still coming. That at one time may not have existed or entered into the realm of this world, but that there are spirits coming that are on assignment. And he said, and it should come. But he said, and even now, already is it in the world. Anybody see that? You heard already, it was already prophesied. It was already spoken that this spirit of Antichrist would come into the world. But he says, I want you to know that it is already here. But then he says this, and this is the part I wanted to bring home, was that he says in verse 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have did what? Who is he talking about overcoming? That Antichrist, that spirit of Antichrist, those who are working for the Ablo. But he says, but you have did what? You overcame. That's right. You overcome. You overcome them. Why is it that you're overcoming them? How is it that you are empowered? How is it that you're able to overcome these who are working by satanic influence and powers, those who are working by the Spirit? How is it that you overcome? He said, because greater is he that is where? In you than he that is in the world. Who is it that you have in you? <laughs> the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to fear those who are working by that demonic realm or those demonic entities, spiritual entities, because the Lord says, who you have in you is greater than those that are in the world. <laughs> That's right, ammunition. And that's why I love this scripture in chapter 5 of 1 John, because I believe it connects the two. We talked about this one night in class. He says in verse 18 of chapter 5 of 1 John, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. When you're born of God, when you're born of the Spirit, the wicked one can't even touch you. Somebody say, you can't touch this? (laughs) I hear you, hammer. (laughs) All right. That's heavy. That's heavy. Sometimes when you read, you're like, Lord, help me to understand. Help me, not only to understand, help me to receive it. Because you can be taught a certain way for so long that when you see something like this, although it's black and white and it's right in the scripture, it's hard sometimes to really understand it. You almost begin to say, how can these things be? Who does that sound like? Nicodemus? How is it a man going to be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? She's going to say, no, get out of here. <laughs> But what happens, it's like the guy who said to his son, he said, I need you to go hammer a hundred nails in, the, in this fence outside. He hammers all hundred. The father said, no, I chain my mind, take all the nails out. He took the nails out. He said, dad, what about the holes? Well, here's some wood filler. Put the wood filler in there. So he put the wood filler in all hundred holes, sand it down, repaint it. Look, dad. He said, all the holes are gone. It looked brand new. He took him to the back side and said, look at all the splinters. Even though it looked like you fixed it on the outside, but look at the other side. The splinters are still there. So what am I saying with that? Is that when you have an understanding that is limited concerning certain matters of Scripture or certain things, that even when the truth is presented, you hear it, but on the inside, you're like, nah, this can't be. The damage was already done. It's hard to undo something that you've been attracted or attached to for so long. 
That's why the old folks say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. That's why the Indians, a lot of times, when they would find a horse, they would have to break the wheel of that horse. Because the horse was used to doing things his way. Have you allowed the Holy Spirit to break your will? <laughs> he doesn't do it by force. It's only if you allow him. That's right. Back to free will. And he's being a perfect gentleman. So these things we're talking about, the gate of hell, research it. Look it up. Don't just take my word for it. The other thing, I'll put this up here if you want to take this as a note. This is what happened at Caesarea Philippi. It was a reversal. The Gentile nations. If you remember, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the 32nd chapter, verse 8, it says, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam. And interesting, he didn't call them the sons of God at that time. He called them the sons of Adam because of the fact that they were of these foreign nations. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. The Bible says in verse 9, for the Lord's portion is his people. The Lord's allotment is his people. Who is his people? Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Jacob, whose name was changed to who? Israel. And as we go down to verse 10, he said he found him in a desert land and in a waste, howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. This is one of few places where he refers to Jacob or Israel as a man and not as a woman. Most of the time when you hear Israel, she, her. But yet, he says here, and as an eagle stirred up her nest, fluttered over her young, spread it abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. Although it appears, according to Psalm 82, that there were other spiritual entities that God allowed to rule over or to reign over or to judge the other nations, but he said, yet, Jacob, Israel is my portion. But yet, God made a covenant with Abraham that one day that you'll be the father of many nations. So what happened when Jesus is here at Caesarea Philippi, which was also called Benias and Panias, you see a reversal of God's attitude towards Gentiles through his son. It reminds you of a scripture in Ephesians where he says, no more are you strangers. That's right. Let me turn over there real quick. Ephesians. See, when you come to class, it's like finger aerobics. Going back and forth through the scriptures. All right. We're going to go to the book of Ephesians. I think it's chapter 2. Yes. Chapter 2. Verse 11. Ephesians 2, 11. Paul says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, outcasts basically, and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But verse 13 is where it feels good. He said, but now in Christ Jesus, 
ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by what? The blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinance, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you that were afar off and to them that were not. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers, no more foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the whole building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye are also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Jesus made a proclamation. Hell, where is this thing? Or death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? You've been swallowed up. You can't withstand this. The brother said, you can't touch this. <laughs> and just when Satan thought he was going to have the victory, but had the principalities of this world known, they would not have crucified him. That death was only the path to life. Not just for him, but for all of humanity. That now all nations under one God, indivisible. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> to God be the glory. The culmination of that. Back to Acts chapter 2. Or, yeah, is it 2 or 1? We're going to end here. Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the Spirit of God came into the place, moved upon them, rested upon them, came within them. And then at that moment, they began to speak in tongues. This tongue were the languages of these nations that were disinherited. But that the promise of God will be fulfilled. That he's going to receive all nations back unto himself. The scripture says in verse 7 of chapter 2, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Then how is it that we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Persia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya, Cyrene, the strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they begin to mock, thinking that these men must be drunk of some new wine. But yet Peter stands up with boldness. And begin to let them know, but this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. Verse 17 said, and it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit. Of my spirit upon who? All flesh. All flesh. Don't you know that's all nations? And your sons and your daughters shall do what? Prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever, all nations, 
male, female, boy, girl, whatever your nationality, Jew, Gentile, shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. He got the glory in all of this. He did not forget about us, but brought us back into the fold. God's grace. God's grace. You got power. Satan's intimidated. Go home and flip the script on him. <laughs> God, you don't want to go home. Wait a minute. Uh-uh, not no more. I know who I am, and I know who I have in me. And by the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I stand on that authority. That's who we are. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Bible Church of Christ Bookstore has all your ministerial needs. A new Bible, study aids, tracts, church supplies, robes, clergy apparel, t-shirts, DVDs, or music. Look no further. They're there for you and would love the opportunity to meet and pray with you. Enjoy their selection of English and Spanish merchandise to further you on your spiritual journey. The BCCBookstore.com for store hours and directions. The BCCBookstore.com.